right, all right. All right, uh, welcome in. Uh, you know, I figure my colleagues, Justin Tell, Mike Griffith, Mike Corvell, Brandon Adams, they do their own sort of live shows and this new reality we're living in. And I figure why not do one from Connor Riley, which is me. I'm, obviously, it's my first time doing this. So if it goes well, we'll keep doing them. And if not, you'll probably just hear me on Dog Nation Daily once in a while. But uh, my name is Connor Riley, as I said. Welcome in. Uh, I got a couple things we want to talk about. And obviously, anything you guys at home want to talk about. Uh, you know, obviously, some of the football practice going on right now, you know, the news cycle is a little different. But there is still new stuff out there. Uh, you know, NFL signings, Georgia football players on Twitter sort of showing us their workouts, letting us know what they're doing. The NFL draft is, as of right now, still on, still upcoming. So we'll see how that goes. Uh, there's quite a good bit of things to talk about and figure why not take a little time out of Thursday night. Hopefully, like I said, this goes well every Thursday night. We, uh, we do a little broadcast like this. We're going to go half an hour, 30 minutes, see what do you guys have to say, who says what, how things go. So we'll sort of go from there. And uh, off the top of the show, I figure you're going to see something on this uh, that I did another video on right about tomorrow morning on Dog Nation. Uh, Todd Gurley to the Atlanta Falcons. Obviously, this officially happened last week. He was let go by the Rams. Signed by the Falcons on Friday on a one-year deal. And, you know, there are some people who are skeptical of it. You know, they think, oh, his knee, his question marks, you know. Falcons are a team that they have a lot of issues. They did go 7-9 and nine in the playoffs the last two years. Why are they signing a running back who looks to be on the back nine of his career? I sort of disagree with the premise with all of that. Gurley, it's a low-risk, high-reward signing. You know, if it doesn't work out, you only sign him for one year. And if things really don't work out, you know, a.k.a. the Falcons miss the playoffs, Quinn and maybe even GM Thomas Dimitrov lose their jobs anyway. But if this works out, which I think there's a good chance that there is, just given that, you know, if Todd's right, and, and ultimately we don't know how good or how healthy that knee is, if Todd's right, this could be, again, one of the best offenses in the NFL, which the year the Falcons went to the Super Bowl, they had, point blank, the best offense in the NFL. And, you know, for, I think maybe the first time in, in his career, Gurley isn't the most talented player on his own offense. You know, in St. Louis, in St. Louis and Los Angeles, he had to carry a lot of the load sort of be the focal point. Him coming to Atlanta, that is not going to be the case. Teams will not be loading the box, you know, trying to watch, guard, prepare against Todd Gurley. He's got Julio Jones, who's far and away the best wide receiver he's ever played with. He's got Calvin Ridley, another very good wide receiver, obviously not better than Brandon Cooks or Robert Woods or even Cooper Cup, because after all, me and my roommate, Brandon Conklin, like to say this is a Cooper Cup household, but Calvin Ridley, Matt Ryan, as much as I have stock in Jared Goff and like Jared Goff, Matt Ryan is the best quarterback he's played with point blank. You mix all those things in there together, and the Falcons, they've spent assets on their offensive line. The Falcons, on paper, have a potential to be a very, very good, possibly one of the better offenses. They just, you know, obviously need to avoid injuries and sort of make sure things click. And with Gurley, you know, I was never all that high on Devontae Freeman. Uh, personally, I think if – you know, going back to when Gurley was not drafted by the Falcons and they took Vic Beasley, I think if you put Gurley on that 2016 uh, Falcons team, the one that played for the Super Bowl, that blew a 28-3 to lead. Sorry, I'm a New England Patriots fan. I have to bring this up. Uh, but I think if Gurley's on that Falcons team, I don't think Gurley whiffs on a block on Dante Hightower the same way Devontae Freeman did in that game. And, and I think, you know, Obviously, the explosiveness and all that he brings to the table, I, I think that makes that Falcons team somehow even more dangerous and probably even more likely to, you know, want to run the ball, want to run the clock out there. And Gurley and it's Kyle Shanahan system, perfect. Gurley's vision is unparalleled. It's as weird as it is to say, it's maybe his best attribute, and, and that's essentially what you really need to succeed in a Kyle Shanahan offense. So, you know, that's obviously the revisionist aspect of it, but, you know, if, if Gurley is able to give the Falcons anything positive at all, that makes life easier for Matt Ryan. It makes life easier for Julio Jones. It makes life easier for that entire offense. And ultimately, I, I do think that this year's Falcons team is going to go as far as this offense is willing to carry them. And Gurley could play a really significant role in that. I, I, I think he's, you know, at times you still see he's a guy who can be a productive player. He did still have 12 touchdowns last year. Obviously, he had a career low 
in rushing yards, but he's still, I think, able to do some things that can make him a productive player. Is he going to be the player he was in 2017 when he won the NFL's Offensive Player of the Year award? I don't think so. But if he can be somewhere in between what he was last year and what he was in the 2017 season, you know, that probably puts the Falcons in a really good chance to make the playoffs. And as far as, you know, the obvious Georgia connection, I, I think any knowledgeable Georgia fan knows that the Falcons do not have a history with Georgia players. The last Georgia player they drafted was back in 2011. That was Akeem Dent. I don't think that's going to change a whole lot this year, though. You know, J.R. Reed, I think, would be a great safety for them. I think J.R. Reed would be a great safety for anybody. Um, so there is obviously not a lot of history between Georgia and Atlanta. And as much as my Falcons fans and Falcons friends love the Falcons, the Falcons are the second most popular team in the state. Georgia is, I still think, the most popular team here. And bringing in a guy like Gurley who – other than maybe Nick Chubb and Roquan Smith, I, I would say it's probably the third most popular, or most recognized, most beloved Georgia football player this past decade. And you bring him in there. I mean, he showed last night on, on the, the I'm Coming Home video he shared. A ton of Georgia highlights in there. And, and that gets Georgia fans really excited. And I, I think Georgia fans now have something to look forward to where, because they obviously all root for their guys, but, you know, there aren't as many Georgia fans following the Los Angeles Rams every Sunday as there are that are following the Atlanta Falcons. So now you go from a Sunday or on a Saturday cheering for guys like Zamir White, James Cook, Kenny McIntosh, whoever that starting running back ends up being. And then the next day they're able to roll into Sunday and still support a Georgia football player at running back for the in-state team and the Atlanta Falcons. I think, you know, from a business standpoint, this is an obvious huge win for the Falcons, something that, you know, is going to generate a lot of interest and a lot more, I think, local interest, which usually translates to more to more dollars, more money. And you, I, I've seen friends and, and people said, I want to get a girly Falcons jersey now. That's something I want. It's something I want to own. Even though, you know, odds are he's probably only going to be here one year because if things go really well for girly this year, like I think there's a chance that they can. You know, someone might spend a few more, uh, a few more millions of dollars on him next year to go play somewhere else. But for right now, in, 20, in the 2020 season, I, I think that's a significant move for both Gurley because he's clearly still beloved in the state. One of the most popular, again, well-known Georgia players out there. I think for the Falcons, this generates interest. This, you know, pulls, I think, a little bit of pressure off this team. I, I do think the Falcons probably are on the short list of teams with the most pressure on them going into this 2020 season because if they don't make the playoffs, there's going to be a lot of change at the top of this organization. So you bring that in, I think Gurley, it eases it eases everyone a little bit. They want to see him. They want to see how things go. It takes things away from this sort of playoff, hey, let's get back to the Super Bowl kind of thing. It's, hey, this guy's a super, This guy was a superstar, great local college player. Let's see if he can bring some of that same excitement back to what he, what he was and what he used to be. Uh, obviously, you know, Jermaine King brings up 11 first-round draft picks on uh, – on Atlanta's starting offensive line, it's assuming Laquan Treadwell, who, who was as good a college receiver as I can remember, uh, who he recently signed with the Falcons there. They can start 11 first-round draft picks on offense. Now, you know, how good that ends up being, you know, Jake Matthews was a first-round draft pick, but I don't think he's necessarily played up to his draft billing. Uh, Chris Lynn, they took two offensive linemen in the first round last year, and Chris Lindstrom, one of the guards, he missed most of the season with an injury. So we'll sort of see how that goes. But again, to Jermaine's point, I think on paper – this is a potential to be one of the better offenses in the league next year. It'll be largely what we get out of Matt Ryan and ultimately whatever Gurley, I think, is able to give him. If Gurley, you know, 1,200 yards, 10 touchdowns, and the 10 touchdowns, you know, while that does sound like a lot, it's a step back from where he was this year. If he has 1,200 yards, 10 touchdowns, maybe 400 receiving yards, that's sort of in between, you know, obviously where his low point was last year with 207 and then on the higher end in 2017 when he had over 700 yards. But you sort of get in those range, you know, 1,600 total yards, 13, 12, 13 total touchdowns. That's a really successful season for Gurley, and that's a really, I think, big key to the Falcons' success there. And, you know, Mary Justice, Gurley will give 110%. I, I, I agree. I, I think Gurley knows that this kind of has to go well with him, just given how things end with the Rams. You know, he gets cut halfway through a four-year, $60 million deal. He does have his money. So that's obviously, I, I think, a good thing for him, and you feel a little bit less bad about it. You know, 45 of that $60 million contract was guaranteed. Uh, but this is a guy, you know, five years ago, I guess six years ago now, in the end, at the end of September, he was the runaway Heisman favorite, and then obviously he gets a suspension, and then he comes back and he hurts his ACL, which has, I think, 
hindered and sort of shown him why he slowed down these past couple of years for the Rams. But when this guy is right, and you know, maybe he maybe he gets right, maybe you know his knee issue clears up a little bit, he can be as good as any running back in the NFL, and we've seen that. And if that's the really they get, you know. I know Tampa Bay just added Tom Brady, who I have my own complicated personal thoughts on. I don't know how you're forever a Patriot and yet somehow not a Patriot for your entire career. Um, having said all that, you know, the Saints, what are you going to get out of Drew Brees? You know, and then the Panthers are playing Teddy Bridgewater. The Falcons clearly have the most stable quarterback position going into this year. And I think if Gurley is able to help that offense sort of give them a sort of running threat that they certainly didn't, I don't think, had this past year. I think that's going to make things very easy for the Falcons to potentially get back into the playoffs. Uh, we're about 10 minutes in here. We'll probably go potentially a good 30 minutes. Uh, Leslie smith Bowers reports uh, Terry Godwin signed a one-year deal for the Jaguars. I think I, I, I think with Terry, you know, he didn't have the senior year that he wanted to at Georgia. I don't think anyone sort of did. Uh, he sort of expected his last year at Georgia to go the way that it did. But if he can find the right spot, one, he's, a, he's a, at the very worst, he's a darn good special teams player and, you know, if you're really good at that and you excel at that, you can make a 10-year career. Matthew Slater uh, is a guy for the Patriots. I believe he's 12 or 13 years in the league and has made it as a special teams or teams player. And then, you know, sometimes a lot of guys, because injuries happen and prop up over the course of the season, you'll see guys who were special teams players, like I say, a Terry Godwin, sort of move into that wide receiver rotation. And, you know, I think Jacksonville, they've got Chris Conley there already. You know, there's probably a little bit of a relationship there. So we'll sort of see, you know, if Terry can catch on and, you know, hopefully make a career because at college, you know, especially after his junior year, I think a lot of people sort of expected him to really blossom and, and blow up. And unfortunately, he just sort of didn't have, I think, that senior year that uh, he wanted to. Uh, yes, I do have a lot of birds. Uh, I'm a very light sleeper and in the morning uh, can be a little tough uh, hearing those birds chirping early in the morning. But, uh, yeah, we're taking advantage of this nice weather. Uh Right now, the pond has not gotten to me too bad, but we're sort of enjoying the sunset here in Atlanta, uh, just sort of trying to make the most of this. It's a beautiful, gorgeous day outside and sort of enjoy that for what it is. Uh, sort of pivoting to second thing I sort of really want to talk about. Uh, as you can kind of tell, I'm a little sweaty. I, uh, I just about half an hour ago finished a workout. We did another one of uh, Scott Sinclair's workouts today. It was uh, using, you know, grocery items. I used a water jug. Uh but Sinclair, for about uh, a little over a week now, he has been posting sort of workouts that you can do from home. Uh, for the most part, you know, some days there's some equipment that, you know, you don't have. Like, I don't have bands. I don't have a squat rack. I don't have, you know, the necessary squat weights lying around. But a, a lot of these workouts are things that common people like myself are able to do from their house or from their home. And for a lot of people, they like going to the gym that routine has been disrupted given the current situation and status of everything. But for me, it's a professional who's offering, you know, professional expertise or at least some sort of structure. And every day between, you know, three, five o'clock ish, I try to get in and do this workout. And I do think it's one of the positive things to come out of this for a couple of reasons. One is just, it gives me, and I think it gives a lot of people who are doing these workouts sort of a structure to follow during the course of the day. They know that, Hey, as long as Sinclair is pumping out these workouts on Twitter and giving you a blow by blow of how to do it, I'm going to try and knock this out at a certain point in my day. I know I've made it a part of my routine. And I think, you know, with working out and a lot of things in life, just having a routine aspect or a routine element to it, I, I, I think makes it, you know, easier to do. It's easier to work out every day. You know, I, I was a high school football player. You know, I was waking up at six, seven o'clock in the morning every day to go lift. And because that was part of my routine, it's easier than it sounds of just, hey, I'm waking up at six o'clock to go lift weights at 7 a.m. before school every morning. You know, obviously, I clearly got away with that. I put, I put on a considerable amount of weight since high school. But I, with with this sort of thing and Sinclair and him offering this out there and, you know, no, I, I don't know if Kirby or anyone had told him to do it. I just, I just think he thought it was something to do, something to sort of take everyone's mind off this current situation. I think having that out there, I think it really helps just people sort of adjust a little bit, make things part of a routine, make things a little bit more normal or at least understandable. I know Jimmy Barnes brings up, I found himself exercising more, being stuck at home. And, and yeah, that's that's a big thing. You know, sitting out, you can only sit on the couch and watch TV for so long and for so many hours. So, you know, being able to do these workouts, you know, whether it takes 30, 45, however long it takes you to do them, I do think that 
and having that out there and, and putting that out there on social media to give people that sort of, you know, calmness, easiness, so sort of an escape from what we're currently going through. I think it helps a lot of people. And, and for Sinclair, you know, right now, you know, three or I guess a month ago before this had really blown up or, well, technically, you know, back in, you know, when, when uh, Scott Cochran had been hired, right now Sinclair is the second most famous strength and conditioning coach on Georgia's staff. And, you know, there were some people wondering, Georgia bringing him in, what might he, what might uh, Cochran bring to the strength and conditioning program? But Sinclair is really, I think, making a name for himself. He's putting himself out there. He is, you know, right now, really, I think the face of the Georgia program is current set, step, uh, this current situation. I know for a fact he's, he's giving sort of individualized workouts to players, communicating with them through that you know, sort of making sure they're staying in shape that for whenever we get the all clear and things sort of return to normal a little bit, those guys are ready to get back and hit things rolling. But for Sinclair, I think this is a great way to sort of put himself out there, build a brand, sort of become a more known name, you know, potentially, you know, I don't think just one off season can do this, but long term, you know, make a bigger name, bigger brand for himself, sort of in the way that Cochran did at Alabama, and he does that, and, you know, it might not be all that long from now, four or five years from now, where Sinclair, maybe if he wants to, makes that same jump from strength and conditioning coach to special teams coach to potential one-day head coach, which I think is what everyone sort of expects Cochran to be, uh, you know, not at Georgia, obviously, but eventually down the line. And I think this is a really good start. It's a really good people way for people to sort of know and get to know about Sinclair. I, I certainly think more people know who he is today than when this whole sort of thing started uh, whenever it did. It's, it's hard to keep track of days. I guess it's been two weeks now since the, the Rudy Gobert thing popped up, uh, which I think really set things, set all these sort of things in motion. But, you know, it, it's easy to certainly say that Sinclair, I think, is a bigger name. And, and ultimately, and I think this is the uh, – and, and again, uh, you, people mentioned, you know, missing sort of the, the, the football aspect of it. This is a way to sort of – keep at least some aspect of the Georgia program out there. Uh, you know, last week, guys like Nolan Smith, Eric Stokes, Monty Rice were posting their workouts for Sinclair to publicly see, but for also everyone else to see. And I would, you know, if, if this message somehow gets them, I would hope that they continue to do that just because I think you know, a lot of Georgia football fans and people out there, they want to hear from, from guys like Jamie Newman, from guys like Monty Rice, Eric Stokes, these faces that they know that they want to know. And, you know, seeing them going about their business, you know, staying in shape, working out, I think that encourages other people and says, hey, you know, maybe this thing isn't necessarily as dire as it potentially might be. And I think that all stems back from, from Sinclair. And Sinclair's not the only strength coach in the country that's sort of out there pushing stuff like this. I know The Athletic the other day featured a story talking to a couple of those strength coaches about where they are and sort of how they're going about handling this thing. But I think – with what Sinclair is doing and sort of, and I'll eventually have a longer story about this, you know, a week or two from now, just sort of on my experiences with it and, and how it's all going. I think this is ultimately a good thing. And I don't know if it's going to continue when things get back to normal. I would certainly love to see it do so, but at the end of the day, he's paid to keep uh, Georgia football players in shape instead of sort of schmucks like me. So, you know, with that, again, I, I think I really love, and I really personally appreciate what Sinclair is doing during the, during this time, just saying, hey, I know things aren't easy. If you want to get a workout in, here's a couple things you can do from your home. For the most part, everyone's able to do these, whether you have a chair, you know, he's using canned goods. You know, I would say probably 85, 80% of the time he's using stuff you can find around your house. He's tweeting them out every morning uh, at his uh, Twitter account. Just search uh, Scott Sinclair. It's out there. Would a, you know, if you're someone like me who's like just looking to get in shape or try and stay in shape, I think it's a great way. As you can tell, I clearly sweat a lot. It's a really good workout, and I, it's it's obviously a variety of different things. And ultimately, I, I do think this this having this and being able to do this, you know, knowing that when I wake up in the morning, I'm going to be able to say to myself, I can knock out an hour of of this day, you know, just by working out and doing what this clearly very qualified and professional strength and conditioning coach is able to tell me what to do. So, again, I. Just, want to say you know thank you and a hat tip a hat tip to uh scott sinclair uh we're about 20 minutes and we'll go maybe about another 10 minutes uh you have any comments questions uh, i've written a lot about alabama and florida this week and how georgia sort of stacks up to them so right now well, let me take a water break 
But right now, I think, you know, Alabama is the team. Georgia is, is clearly chasing on just an annual basis. And then Florida is the team that Georgia is trying to stay ahead of on an annual basis and sort of where they stand in regard to both those teams and how they can either close that gap or, in, in the Florida case, extend that gap. Uh, obviously, you know, I'm more a game to talk about anything non-sports related. Uh, you have recommendations, stuff you've been watching, pop culture you've been consuming. Uh, I recently finished rewatching the first season of The Wire. It's a fantastic show. Uh, probably not for everyone. It's a very intense show, but from you know a, a true fan of television, someone who loves that sort of stuff and storytelling, uh, it does not get better than The Wire. Uh, I could not recommend more watching Survivor on CBS. Uh, in my opinion, it is the best show on television week in, week out. It is basically sports. Uh, it is a all-star, a true all-star season. It is an all-winner season. Uh, however, there's certainly been a theme going of the older school, old school players, the guys who, you know, when people were really watching Survivor, uh, they've all been voted out. And so it's a lot of the newer school faces, uh, new school players. But, you know, that's something it's on 8 o'clock CBS every week. That's something that me and my roommates and my a whole lot of my friends really enjoy and look forward to uh, getting to partake in. Uh, let's see, what else? Uh, let's see. We heard about uh, Matt Luke a little bit earlier this week. Uh, he, I, I think, did something that is is a, a departure from what we've traditionally seen from Georgia assistance. And obviously, I think part of this was spurred on by the you know social distancing and all that. But he sort of he went to Twitter with him and his family, and sort of just talked about you know where life is, what they're doing, how they're sort of making it through this time, and. It's a market departure, I think, from what we've traditionally come to expect from the Georgia program in terms of assistance and hearing from them. You know, Kirby, obviously coming from the uh, Nick Saban school. That's a uh, couple – take a quick break here. Ozark, yes, Ozark. Uh, I have not seen that show, but I've heard a lot of people recommend it. I believe a new season is coming out, I believe, tomorrow. Uh, so if you are a psychopath and want to catch up before tomorrow night, uh, go ahead and do that. That is on Netflix. Uh, Jermaine King brings up Poverty. Uh, yes, Poverty, I believe Shallow might be her last name. Uh, she is a Georgia graduate, a University of Georgia alum. She won season 16, Micronesia. Uh, she probably could have won um, season 20, Heroes versus Villains as well. Uh, she's someone who's actually, and this is just getting way in the weeds and way up towards the football, been one of the more like enjoyable players to watch and sort of you know see how her game has adapted. And I think, you know, her coming back and playing on the season, this is the first time she's played since season 20, uh, which is, I think, 10, 10 years ago. She is uh, someone who's really, I think, benefited from coming back on this season. and been It's one of the highlights to watch. Um, anyway, back to Matt Luke. Uh, and I'm not, Frank, I'm not saying that it's not awesome. It's just I just have not had time to watch it. I watch plenty of enough intense television shows. I watch Westworld. Uh, that season is on season three right now. It's a very confusing show, but it's actually pretty good and, and not all that bad. Uh, Curb Your Enthusiasm, the most recent season, watch that. That's a very funny show. But uh, back to Matt Luke, hey, we traditionally have not heard from Georgia Assistance. It's sort of the one voice policy that started with Saban and sort of Kirby Smart definitely was brought in that to uh, Georgia. You know, everything comes from the head coach. Uh, as a Pete writer, we hear – once a year from offensive and defensive coordinators in uh, in August, and that's it until, you know, the bowl game when they are publicly made available. But Luke, I think, going out there and, and sort of speaking and talking and sort of hearing from him shows, I think, the value that he brings to this Georgia program. He is a guy who is a head coach. Of the assistants that Kirby has hired, Luke is the first one that has prior head coaching experience. And I think that is a big thing that, you know, you certainly look at some of the – decisions that were made around Kirby early on in his career. You know, he didn't really have anyone or someone who had been in the chair who has that head coaching experience to sort of bounce it off of. And I think having a guy like Luke and Todd Munkin, who we also brought in, who has, who is a head coach at Southern Miss, having that I think is going to be a real asset to Kirby and this Georgia program when we see things down the line. You know, I, I, I mentioned Sinclair earlier. I don't think Luke is long for Georgia. Uh, I don't think Munkin is either. If things go well, it would not be a surprise to see those guys eventually become head coaches again. But I, I think having Luke out there, having him, you know, preach this, hey, I'm going through it just like you are with my family. We know it's hard right now, but it's just sort of where we are, and we're just going to make the most of it. And I, I, I think that was a really good message to sort of put out there and spread and, and speak into the world. And I hopefully, and, you know, you saw Cortez Hankton share something yesterday. I hope personally we get to hear from all the Georgia assistants. I, I think hearing from them, 
t- seeing what they're going through, players as well. I, I, I think that's something that we kind of need in this time, you know, something that is going to, you know, distract us for even the smallest minutes, hours, however long, to sort of, you know, keep us going. Um, there was one comment. Uh, where is it? Where is it? Uh, Robert Moody asked, what's the word on our new quarterback? New quarterback, uh, I'm assuming you're referring to, is Jamie Newman, uh, a Wake Forest graduate transfer. Obviously, with and I wrote, this, wrote about this last week, uh, Newman, I, I believe, is the player most impacted by the cancellation of spring practice. Uh, Georgia brought him in specifically when they did, and they made a move on him because they knew that he was going to be there in the spring and be able to go through that and go through those reps. That is obviously now washed away. There were other talented options out there. KJ Costello comes to mind. But I do think that Newman, he's gone through the program. He's gotten to meet with players. He's gone through workouts with them. He knows them a bit more. He's more familiar than he would be if he were coming in the summer. You know, you think like a guy like Trey McKitty, the tight end from Florida State, you know, what's the situation with his graduation? When is he going to be able to show up on campus if, if and when they open campus? You know, there are a lot more questions there, whereas, you know, with Newman, him being on campus and being a little bit more familiar – him sort of already going through and understanding the Georgia culture. I, I do think that, you know, potentially puts him better off than if Georgia was just bringing in a traditional transfer that was coming over the summer. Now, uh, Quincy Avery is his quarterback trainer, and there was a story on Yahoo uh, today, and I'll do some more reporting on this next week, where Avery, his quarterback trainer, is essentially setting up uh, these virtual training sessions through Zoom, which is sort of a social teleconferencing application and he's giving instructions and tutors and sort of tips and pointers to his clients and guys he works with. And Newman is a guy he's worked with pretty closely. Again, Avery is a guy he's worked with high profile quarterbacks like Josh Dobbs, Deshaun Watson, a certain quarterback that plays for Ohio state that we don't like to mention around here. Um, but you know, a- Newman is still getting tips, still working out, still going through things. Uh, it's just, obviously it's a lot more difficult. And unfortunately uh, you know, if if we weren't in the situation that we were in, he'd be at a Georgia practice right now, uh, having a complete, I believe, his fifth spring practice. So in that sense, you know, he obviously I think misses out and loses quite a bit of just not being able to go through the spring. But long term, or i.e., when the season rolls around, personally, I, I think we're going to get some practice, some extra practices in July. That's, that there's no reporting there. That's just you know speculation. But I think they'll they'll add anywhere from maybe five to ten practices in there that's going to help Newman out a lot and I think that has a chance to really help those freshmen those freshmen out a lot because those early enrollees the guys who aren't early enrollees guys like Marcus Roseme, Jermaine Burton, Mikhail Sherman, Jalen Carter those guys don't get the benefit they was out of practices in the spring but if those practices are moved to July I think those extra five to ten practices are really going to potentially help them make an impact early on so you get to see hopefully Newman there before August and, and in sort of that aspect and then I mean, the reality is, and I've, I've been guarded and skeptical of what Newman might bring and what his ultimate ceiling is. I think some of the Heisman stuff is, is putting their cart before the barn. I, I think, I, I think you know, the pro football focus rating him as the third best quarterback in the country coming back, I think that's kind of ridiculous. But that's neither here nor there. I do think that and you know, we're going to learn a lot of it in those first three weeks when they're against Virginia on a Monday night in Atlanta, and then 12 days later they're in Tuscaloosa probably under the lights. Uh, playing Alabama in what should be a top five game. That's going to be a, a bigger, more hyped, crazy environment than Newman's ever played in. Yes, he played Clemson at Wake Forest. The game did not go well at all. They lost fifty-two to three. But there's a difference when you're playing when you're a Wake Forest playing at Clemson and a Georgia playing in Alabama. And I think, you know, I think we'll know a whole lot about Newman and what Georgia certainly has with him when we wake up on the morning of September 20th and hopefully we'll have played football. I do think we'll have played football by then and sort of know what Georgia has in Jamie Newman. We're, uh, we're running up around the, uh, 30 minute mark here. Yeah. And you'll ask questions, comments, uh, get them in right now. I did not just mow my lawn. Uh, it's actually a sensitive subject in my family. My dad has been trying to get me to come up to, uh, aerate the yard. Uh, we have a rather large yard. Um, we're, we're trying to work that out. Uh, I, I think eventually it'll get done, but we'll see. Uh, as I had mentioned earlier, I was uh, doing the Scott Sinclair workouts and uh, figure instead of getting a shower, why not just come in here, show that I did it, and, and then you know make it more credible that I'm able to talk about it. Um, we've, uh, we've hit the 30-minute mark. 
Uh, it's been fun. I thought this was good. I thought we had a nice conversation. Uh, got some good comments. Uh, thank you to Frank, Robert Moody, uh, Tyler Jenkins. Thank you guys for your comments. Uh, you know, hopefully we'll do this again. Hopefully the weather's great again next week. We can do this outside again. That way you can hear the birds and all the chirping and stuff that's going on. Uh, I'll have some stuff coming, obviously, Friday and Saturday. Friday I'll have a, a, a deeper video look at Todd Gurley. Saturday we'll do an updated version of uh, – of the bracket, it'll be moving on to the final four. Son of Michelle's touchdown run is going to win that thing easily, uh, it, which didn't surprise wouldn't have surprised me from the start, but it's just been blowing through all of this competition. So uh, you'll see content from me, obviously all my coworkers. Uh, Jeff Santel has a very good story coming up on Sunday regarding a certain quarterback commitment. Uh, he's committed to the Georgia program right now that I would I would uh, keep an eye out for. Uh, and you know, Dog Nation Daily will be back Friday morning, 10 a.m on Facebook and YouTube. So Facebook, you've been a great time. YouTube, we got this up and maybe in a few weeks we'll alternate, you know, go Facebook one time, YouTube another. So we're going to sort of see how this goes. But uh, it's been great seeing you guys. Stay safe. Stay practicing social distancing. Try to make this the best situation you can and just look on the positive side and enjoy the life that we do get to have right now. For Dog Nation, I'm Connor Riley. See you guys.